Whitehall, 1212. This is Scotland Yard. For the first time in history, Scotland Yard opens its official files to bring you the true stories of some of its most baffling cases. These are the true stories. The plain, unvarnished facts, just as they occurred, reenacted for you by an all-British cast. Only the names of the participants have for obvious reasons been changed. The stories are presented with the full cooperation of Scotland Yard. Research on Whitehall 1212 is compiled through arrangement with Percy Hoskins, chief crime reporter of the London Daily Express. The stories for radio are written and directed by Willis Cooper. Chief Superintendent John Davidson is the curator of the famous Black Museum of Scotland Yard. He will brief you on today's case from the official files of Scotland Yard, number 899-MR-952. Good afternoon, if you're a murderer by trade, I would suggest that there is no surer way to hasten the end of your career than to select a policeman as your victim. Now, this thing is the running board of a motor car. It was concerned in the brutal death by violence of a police constable. Now, Chief Inspector Quentin tabs it up. Scotland Yard knows more about this case than any other person. I think that's true, John. Although there were two other men who knew more about it than I. But they're not living. No, they're not. Comparatively few men survive hanging. The chief constable of Essex telephoned the CID from Romford at 9.05 on the morning of Tuesday, September the 27th, asking that officers be sent to Stapleford Abbots, a village halfway between Romford and Ongar on the London Chelmsford Road. I was first on the chief inspector's rotor, so I was assigned to the case. Accompanied by Detective Sergeant Philip Melanchthon Wise, I went at once to Stapleford Abbots, which is about four miles outside the limits of the Metropolitan Police area. I was shown the body of Police Constable William George Greenley, who had been stationed there, and which had been found alongside the road a few miles from the village at 6.30 that morning, the 27th. The constable explained to Wise and me what had happened. We know it happened sometime after 1.30 a.m., Chief Inspector, because I met him at a conference point at that time. Where, Constable? Near Grove House, on the road to Onga, about 600 yards from where the body was found, sir. Go on. He had been shot four times, sir. Twice through the head and... These other two. That's... Oh, yes, sir. They, they shot the poor chap square in each eye. Horrible. I hope they drown in their own blood, sir. At least they'll hang. Bill Greenley and I was kids together, sir. They'll hang. He had his pencil in his hand, sir. His notebook was lying on the road near him. He'd evidently stopped a car and was talking to them. Marks on the road? I'll show you, sir. It isn't far. I'd rather like to get out of here. Wise and I followed the constable along the road to a spot where it had been cut to a small hill. The banks on either side at the edge of the road shoulders were about six feet high. That's the place, sir. Here's where they found him, sir, where the grass is pressed down. Hmm. Little blood here. Not as much as one would expect, sir. Over there on the other side, you see there's quite a blood stain on the grass. Mm -hmm. We think he was first shot there, and then he dragged himself across the road and they shot his eyes out on this side. Yeah. There was a motor car here, all right? Uh, yes, sir, we saw that. Where's my sergeant, Sergeant Wise? Uh, down the road a bit, sir, back there. Oh, yes. Why are you looking at, Sergeant? Come down here, sir. Come along. What? That car was going pretty fast. See here. Hmm. Skidded off the road, didn't it? 
When he flagged it down, no doubt. See, it skidded through the grass on this side. Tire marks where it stopped. Right out of London, wasn't it? No doubt about that, sir, from the marks. Was there anything written in Constable Greenley's notebook that would give us any idea? Nothing, sir, after the notation about meeting me at Grove House at uh, 1.30. Much traffic through here, Constable? Not much, sir. This chap was certainly going pretty fast. Especially on a twisty road like this one, I'd say. Many fast drivers around here? No, sir, none I know of. Hmm. Stranger then, probably. Except he must have known these twisty roads pretty well, sir. Which puts us right back where we started, doesn't it? Oh, he had a good reason for wanting to. What did you say, Wise? I said either that, sir, or he had a good reason for wanting to get back to London in a great hurry. Now, why would a stranger take the chance of breaking his neck by driving this kind of a road at 40 miles an hour? He's going at least that fast along here by the tire marks. And why should he murder a policeman who stopped him? What do you think, Sergeant Wise? Well, what we need to look for is some crook running away from something. Running back to London to hide. That's a pretty shrewd guess, Wise. Oh, I think so myself, sir. But what was he running from? Well, I wonder I... if that was a stolen car he was running away with, sir. At the tiny police station back in Stapleford Abbots, I asked to have someone remove the bullets from the body of Constable Greenley. A local surgeon volunteered to do it for us for the usual fee provided by the Home Office. After some difficulty, I was put through to Whitehall 1212 in London. I asked for Inspector Bailey. Inspector Bailey speaking. Hello, Pat. Tabs it here. What are you up to, Quentin? Need to know something, old boy. I've got any reports of a car stolen last night in this part of the country? What part of the country are you in? Oh, Stapleford Abbots, Essex, I'm sorry. Well, I'm at the police station in Stapleford Abbots. Ring me back as soon as you can, will you, please? Right. Ten minutes. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Well, what do you think, Wise? Oh, it isn't a bad guess, sir. We'll see. By the way, I, I had a look at those powder stains on the face of the dead chap. Oh? Had a smell, too. They're from black powder. Old-fashioned black powder, not modern nitrocellulose. That'll be something else to check on if we do find anybody. If he has a gun that shoots black powder cartridges... Bye. Good. Excuse me, sir. There's a telephone call for you, sir. Who is it, Constable? London, sir. You can take it on that same phone you were using, sir. Well, thanks. Uh, don't go away. Chief Inspector Tabs are here. It's Bailey here, Chief Inspector. You use second sight or something up there. What? First item on my list of stolen cars for last night is a four-seater Morris Cowley touring car. Painted blue, index mark TW6120. Stolen at about 2.30 a.m. from the garage of Dr. Kelm Haggerty of Billericay. In case you don't know, the name's 12 miles east of where you are. Uh, just a second. Blue Morris Cowley, four-seater, TW6130. No, 6120. Right, TW6120. Dr. Kelm Haggerty, Billericay. About 2.30 a.m. Thanks, old boy. Do as much for you one day. Bye. Bye. Well, that might be our car, gentlemen. All we have to do now is find it, sir. If it is. We'll find it, Wise. I hope so. Now, look, Wise. This car was taken from Billy Ricky at about 2.30 a.m. What I want you to do is to get around the countryside between here and Billy Ricky and talk to people. Yes, sir. I want you to find out if any of the people around here happen to hear a car driving at high speed sometime between 2.30 when it was stolen and 6.30 when they found the constable's body. Yes, sir. We'll accomplish two things, you see. A, whether that's the car we want and... B, by plotting on a map when and where it was heard, its probable destination. Do you see? Right you are, sir. Do you see? Oh, well, certainly, sir. You said there's not much traffic in these parts, Constable. There isn't, sir. Somebody will be sure to have heard it. Well, let's get cracking, then. Yes, what? sir. Where will you be? I'll be back at the yard. I'm going to check up on known motor car thieves. I'll be in touch with you. Good luck, boys. Thank, Thank you, sir. Uh, come on, Constable. 
I returned to my office at Scotland Yard. Before setting in motion our machinery for checking the whereabouts of known criminals who were at liberty, I dispatched Emmons Carlson, an expert on motor car tires, to Stapleford Abbotts to see if he could identify the tire prints the motor car had left on the road. He'd hardly left London when I had a telephone call from Sergeant Wise. We've already had some good luck, sir. A farmer four miles this side of Bellaricky heard a car traveling at high speed at 2.40 in the morning, and a widow a mile and a half further along heard it. She thinks at 2.45 or thereabouts. She says it sounded like a Morris Cowley, like her own car, sir. Better and better, I thought. A little later, reports began coming into me on the known criminals who had been checked in London. Fourteen had already produced alibis. One, a smash-and-grab artist who had dabbled in motor cars, a chap named Whitey Wogan, was having difficulty proving his. The search went on. Information on the stolen Morris Cowley, identification number TW6120, was given general circulation. There were no results. Three reports the next day from Sergeant Wise. One from a retired colonel of the cherry bin, sir. Five miles east of Onga. Heard a car at 3.15 a.m. One from an apothecary at Onga. Five minutes later. One from two men returning from a British Legion meeting at about 3.30. Say they were almost run down by a blue Morris Cowley a few miles south of Onga. They didn't see the number. Twenty-six more people with criminal records were checked. All had alibis. Whitey Wogan still refused to talk. Emmons Carlson reported him from Stapleford Abbotts. Yeah, here it is, sir, on the chart. I made these photographs on the spot. You see? Pretty blurred they are, sir, but you can identify them. Now, here, on the chart, type B, 1 over 3, 2... Or one over two, three, if you like. Mm-hmm. Four parallel lines around the circumference of the tire. Uh. Diagonal lines at the edges of the tire. Mm-hmm. Short diagonals the other direction, in the center. Uh. Oblique parallelograms, you might say. Can't be anything but a Dunlop Fortuna tire. Does that do us any good, Carlson? I telephoned Dr. Kennel Haggerty, sir, at Billericay. The stolen car was equipped with Dunlop Fortunas. No doubt now that that was the murder car. Another report from Sergeant Wise placed the car five miles north of where the constable was murdered at 3.30 a.m., still headed south. I ticked off the reports on a map of the area. It was a circuitous route, but there was no doubt of it. The car was headed for London. But then the trail was lost. A report from Percy Young in the ballistics laboratory. About those bullets taken from the body of the constable who was shot near Stapleford Abbott's chief inspector. Yes, Percy, what you find out? Caliber revolver. Uh, seems to me I should say somewhat obsolete manufacture, but I'm not sure of that. You could identify the particular gun they were fired from if we got hold of it, could you, Percy? Of course. Fetch it in. Unfortunately, I haven't got it, Percy. Unfortunately, I haven't got anything. Unfortunately, all I've got is the knowledge of the car the murderer rode in. And the fact that the car's probably somewhere in London. With the murderer, I hope. Unfortunately, I have no idea who he is. Yet. But we'll find out. You can't murder a policeman and get away with it. I'll bring you the gun sooner or later. Sergeant Wise came in. Good afternoon, sir. Hello, Wise. Got some news for you. Good. What? They found the car. They have? Why didn't they tell me? Your telephone was busy, sir. Ah. Brixton. Been there all night, apparently, they said. Sure it's the car? Blue Morris Carley, four-seater, number TW2160. Mm-hmm. Fingerprint people and all are there now. Looking it over. Brixton, you said? Brixton, yes, sir. That's where Whitey Wogan lives. Who, sir? Car thief. Oh. Won't tell us where he was the night of the murder. Shall I bring him in, sir? Better. I'll go and have a look at the car first, though. Here's his address. See you later there. Right. Could be possible, I thought, as I drove over to Brixton in the police car. We'd see. 
They were going over the Morris Cowley with a fine-tooth comb as I arrived. They hadn't found much, according to the sergeant in charge. Nothing very much, sir. Let's see that list, Thackeray. Ah. Drops of what appears to be blood on right-hand running board, sir. You collected them? All right, sir. Laboratory's got them all ready, sir. Bits of grass and daubs of clay on the edge of the same running board. We'll want that to compare with clay from the spot where the constable was murdered, Sergeant. See to it, Thackeray. Oh, yes, and between the cushions of the front seat, this revolver cartridge, sir. What kind is it? Obsolete type, sir, for a Webley 38, but the issue of this kind of black powder cartridge was discontinued in 1913, sir. I'm quite a expert on firearms, sir. Good. That's just the calm you were looking for, Sergeant. I'm very happy, sir. That all? What about fingerprints? Not a sign of one so far, sir. Still looking, sir, but so far clean as a cold streamer's boots, sir. And who might you be, miss? My name's Miss Winnie Clapsaddle, mister. And I'm here because I come with a sergeant, so don't give me none of your back chatter or dot you one over the ear all like I done him. Oh, don't... Don't, don't open your fly trap to the cops, Whitey, dear. What's going on here? Excuse me, Chief Inspector. Oh, it's you, Sergeant Wise. What? Uh, Excuse me, sir. This is Whitey Wogan. Well, don't I... say a word, Whitey. And, um, who are you, please, miss? I'm his sweetheart. I'm the barmaid at the Saracen's Head Public House, and I'll thank you for none of your back chat, neither, mister. Now, look here. She insisted on coming along, sir, when I picked up Wogan here. But I... I'll do the talking, too. Perhaps you can tell us, then, young woman, why your sweetheart is in possession of all those newspaper cuttings referring to this murder case. Now, Be look... still, Whitey Duck. He's in possession of these here blinking newspaper cuttings because he wants to find out what it is you coppers is badgering him for. The poor lamb. Oh. And the bloodstained bandages I found in your room, Wogan? Oh, Don't it... blush, Whitey, dear. It happens to anyone. What are you talking about? Oh. Hold your temper, Whitey, love. I'll tell you why they're there, and I'll tell you why my poor little Whitey don't want to tell you where he was while this murder was going oh, on. It's God. because I hit him over the noggin with a Guinness bottle when he refused to kiss me in public. Oh, and it God. took two constables to drag us to the police station. <laughs> That's why. Is this true, Wogan? Of course God. it's true. And you can prove it by looking at the police charge sheet for that last night when we was both in the clink for disturbing the peace. He never murdered no one, mister. <laughs> He's just plain embarrassed. It was true. Our only suspect had been nursing a broken crown in jail which his 13 stone sweetheart had inflicted on him. We were at a dead end. The evidence had run out. Here was the murder car. Here was the victim's blood. The forensic laboratory established that the stains were of the same blood type as Constable Greenlee's. We had a cartridge which we were certain was from the murder gun. Scotland Yard had traced everything but the murderer himself. The coroner's inquest on the body of Constable William George Greenlee returned a verdict of Death at the hands of person or persons unknown. He was buried with full police honours. And the bugler sounded the last post at his funeral. Because he had once been a soldier. The home office began paying his wife a pension. We kept on. We questioned more than 1,500 persons who might... who might conceivably have committed the murder. Our man was not among them. But he was still at large. No policeman ever forgets the murder of another policeman. The months went on, and Wise and I were assigned to other cases. One day, almost a year later, Wise came into my office. Hello, Wise. Hello, Chief Inspector. What's up? You ever had a hunch? I never had a good one. Yes. You have had, though. I have one now. Forget it. What's it about, Wise? Well, I was reading in the Police Gazette about a case, a very unimportant case in Sheffield the other day. It was quite interesting. Don't be so bloody mysterious, ma'am. What was it? A lorry driver had some trouble with a reckless driver. The driver shot down a side street and disappeared. Yes? I said it was a hunt, sir. Go ahead. I've only got this report to get out. Well, this lorry driver 
noted down the number of the car. Well, what? It was a stolen car. Uh, thinking about that poor blighter that was murdered, the Essex constable. I haven't forgotten how somebody shot that poor chap's eyes out, Chief Inspector. Neither have I, Philip. Go on. Well, they, they picked up the driver of the stolen car, and this chap told them who he bought the stolen car from. Who? Got it from a garage man in London here named Frederick Guy Sears. Sears? Name means nothing to me. Uh, it didn't to me at first. But out of habit, I expect, I looked him up a little. He has a record. He's been sent down twice. Have the Sheffield police picked him up? No, they can't find him. Oh. What's your hunch? Well, he's a car thief. Apparently. He was in the Royal Engineers, and... Well, that's no crime, so was I. Yes, but you didn't steal a thirty-eight Webley revolver, old boy. Did he? So I hear, Chief Inspector... That boy in Essex was shot with a thirty-eight caliber Webley. Will you still have those bullets they took out of his head? Mm-hmm. Then they could tell us if they came from that gun. If we find the gun. Let's go and look for it. Well, I don't know. That doctor's case of instruments that was in the Morris Cowley, they were never found either. That's right. They might be at his garage, too. Hasn't anybody been in that garage looking for him? Oh, I know the sergeant who was there. He didn't look around very carefully. I think I could get a warrant of search. You said the man was missing. I know where he is. Where? Dartmoor. In prison? No. A friend of his is being released after a three-year term. He went up to welcome him out of prison. He's coming back to London? Today. You seem awfully anxious to find this fellow, Wise. I hate a cop killer, Chief Inspector. Don't you? Get your search warrant. The garage was closed, of course, but we got inside all right. I doubt anyone saw us. It was a relatively empty place. One big, concrete-floored room and the desk in one corner behind a wooden railing. A few tool shelves along one wall. Filing cabinets or two alongside the desk. We walked across the floor first. Not much of an office. Let's have a look in the desk drawers. Right. Empty. This one's empty, too. This, too. Try them all. Doesn't he keep anything here? Pretty careful man. Nothing incriminating for anybody to find. He must keep some papers here or something. What's in here, I wonder? Cabinet. Open it. It's locked. Open it. Is there a pinch bar? Here on the wall. That ought to do. Anything interesting? Uh, alarm clock. Wrenches. What's he want to hide this stuff for? Because it locks up, I guess. Doesn't trust his friends. Suppose so. Look. Look here. What is it? One of those gadgets a doctor puts in his ears and listens to your heart with. Stethoscope. What else? Oh, I dropped it. What is it? There's two or three of them. Look like... That's what they are. What do you mean? My hunch was right. These are doctor's instruments. What was that doctor's name? The one that owned the car? Canon Haggerty. You've got a good memory. Oh, not so good. It's stamped right here on the handle of this lancet or whatever it is. Well, indeed. Now, all we have to do is find that Webley revolver and somebody's going to hang. Well, this cabinet's empty. 
Wonder about those tool shelves. Have to look, I expect. Hope he doesn't walk in on us before we... Speak of the devil, old boy. What? Somebody's coming. There's only this one door. Get on that side. I'll take this one. Right, sir. See anybody? Big husky chap coming. Alone? Seems to be. What do you want me to do, sir? Pick up that spanner there and tap him gently on the sconce if he leaps on me. Right, sir. If you have to hit him, be careful. We'll want to save him for the hangman, you know. If he's the right one. If he isn't, he'll do till the right one comes along. Quiet, sir. Are you Frederick Geysers? Who the devil are you? I'm Chief Inspector Tabs of the Scotland Yard, and I arrest you on... Look out, he's got a revolver. You, you, look out. Drop that. (laughs) Get off my neck, get off. Are you hurt, sir? Get off my neck. Missed. That one did it. Is he out cold? Oh. Doesn't seem to be, sir. Quite. Well, in that case, I Get off me. rest you on suspicion of the murder of Constable William George Green. All right, sir. I warn you that anything you say will be taken down to writing. Maybe using evidence. Have you got the gun, Wise? Have a look at it, sir. Yeah. It's what we're looking for. A Webley 38 revolver. Give me and unless I'm much mistaken, these are old-fashioned black powder cartridges. Come along with us, Mr. Sears. There's a man that wants to see you. an accomplice whom we found easily from the direction Sears gave us had murdered Constable Greenley. You wonder at the brutality of shooting out his eyes. Sears told us why. I heard the picture of the last thing a man sees before he dies stays right on his eyeballs. I was the last thing he seen, but he didn't have any eyeballs left when I got done with him. Sears and his accomplice were tried at Old Bailey a year and a month after they'd committed the murder. They were both hanged. One at Pentonville and one at Wandsworth. The same day. today on Whitehall 1212 were Harvey Hayes, Horace Braham, Lester Fletcher, Guy Spall, Winston Ross, Peter Forrester, Maurice Gosfield, and Beulah Garrick. Whitehall 1212 is written and directed by Willis Cooper. If you were offered odds of 4 to 50, you'd think they were pretty poor, wouldn't you? Well, then just imagine how hopeless a person suffering from cerebral palsy must feel. His chances of getting any kind of treatment are exactly that, 4 out of 50. Well, you say to yourself, why? Why is that? Because it takes money to train the needed specialists, to build and equip the necessary treatment centers, to solve the mysteries of this baffling condition. Although many of the 550,000 sufferers from cerebral palsy are virtually helpless, their cause isn't helpless. No, that's where you come in. They can be helped by accurate diagnosis, by accurate treatment and loving care. Make it possible for them to become useful, productive citizens. They have the will. You can help provide the way. Enlist today in this fight. Send your contributions to United Cerebral Palsy in care of your local postmaster. Forget them not. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.